So we know that microorganisms can exist in all three domains of life. And we know that all of life came from a single point or a single common ancestor, which you can actually see here on this universal phylogenetic tree labeled LUCA. So LUCA stands for the last universal common ancestor. And that means the last common ancestor for all of these different domains. Sometimes this is also called the origin, right? And um, this existence of this uh, last universal common ancestor is important because it means that we can actually um, study both bacteria and archaea and glean information about more evolved organisms um, because we know that they came from the same origin point or the same original ancestor. And so when we're thinking about how these three domains evolved, the best way to really visualize this is in um, a diagram called a universal phylogenetic tree, which you can see here on the right. Um, the universal phylogenetic tree illustrates the evolutionary relationship between all of the three domains. And what's important to note about when you're like looking at and trying to read a phylogenetic tree, um, at least in this case, is that the branch length or the length of these branches here in the tree indicates the amount of evolutionary change or evolutionary differences between two organisms. So exa for example, if you um, want to know how uh, evolutionarily divergent a cyanobacteria is from a fungi, you would need to trace this branch down here, over, and then back up all the way until you reach fungi. And that branch length tells you how divergent those two organisms are from each other. And so you can imagine that the cyanobacteria and a thermococcus here are more closely related than cyanobacteria and fungi, for example. Um, less divergent, there's been less evolutionary change. And the way the universal phylogenetic trees are generated is based on comparing DNA sequences. And it's not a comparison of the entire DNA sequence or the entire genome sequence of these organisms. Um, mostly because that was, at the time when this was being created, too expensive and would take too long. And so um, scientists found a way to kind of choose a small piece of DNA that all of these organisms have, a specific gene, and then look within that specific gene for differences between sequences. The gene that they use is the gene that encodes the small subunit rRNA. And um, rRNA is a component of ribosomes. All cells have ribosomes, which means if you have a cell, you have that gene. Um, and this particular gene encodes the small subunit. And so ribosomes are made up of two parts, a big subunit or a large one, and a small subunit. This gene encodes the small subunit of the rRNA for ribosomes. And by comparing the, those rRNA genes between um, organisms, you can establish their evolutionary relationship. In terms of bacteria, which is what we're going to focus on for microbiology, the specific name of this gene is the 16S rRNA gene. 16S being the uh, small subunit of the ribosome in bacteria. And so how does this work? Right, so here is a picture of the 16S gene, 16S rRNA gene. And the way that this works is that the gene itself is made up of a series of constant regions, which you can see in blue, and variable regions, which you can see in kind of this peach color. And what's nice about that is that the constant regions remain constant between every organism. So every type of bacteria will have the same DNA sequence in these blue constant regions for the 16S gene. And the differences will really exist between the variable regions, right? So sometimes in science we name things really kind of in a boring not uh, way, right? So constant regions remain constant between different types of bacteria. Variable regions, the sequence varies between those bacteria. And so you can look at the sequence of the variable regions and compare it um, from bacteria to bacteria to see differences.
right? And so in this case, the targeted region would be this variable region three and variable region four. And so you would sequence this particular region of the 16S rRNA gene in all of the organisms you were interested in comparing, get those sequences, and then you could start to calculate how divergent those two sequences are from each other and create the phylogenetic tree. So this it works in sort of this manner. You will lyse bacterial cells or bust them open, isolate their DNA, and amplify that region of the 16S gene using a reaction called PCR. And then once you have a small 16S gene, you can sequence it and get that nucleotide sequence, the A, T, Cs, and Gs. And you can repeat that for as many organisms as you want to compare on your phylogenetic tree. You can see the sequences for four organisms down here. And so in order to really calculate how different these sequences are from each other, all that you need to do is count the differences between, or differences in nucleotides between each pair of the sequences. So if we're looking at uh, pairs uh, three and four, for example, we can see that there are one, two, three differences. between a uh, sequence in the organism number three and organism number four. And so in order to calculate the, the basically evolutionary distance or how divergent these sequences are from each other, you take the number of nucleotides that are different, so in this case three, and then you divide that by the total number of nucleotides in the sequence, which in this case is 12. So 3 out of 12 is 0.25. You don't have to worry about this correction for right now. Uh, for the purposes of this course, we're just going to work with this straight up um, ED or the evolutionary distance. Right, so there's three differences between these two sequences. There's 12 nucleotides total, so there's a 0.25 evolutionary distance. And the way that that um, looks on the phylogenetic tree as you can see, organism number three here and organism number four. And you can see these numbers. These numbers indicate the branch lengths, which as I mentioned before, shows you how um, evolutionary distant your two organisms are from each other. But you'll notice that this, these numbers are not 0.25, right? But if you add up 0 0.08, 0 0.08, and 0.15, you do actually get to this evolutionary distance number given here. And so when making the phylogenetic tree, you might have to break up that evolutionary distance in order to make the relationships between all the organisms you're trying to pair, compare work. And this is often difficult to do um, by hand, right? You can do it with one or two or three organisms. But when we're talking about that phylogenetic tree, we're talking about thousands and thousands of organisms. And so often these sequences are not compared by hand, but rather by an algorithm. And then that algorithm generates a tree based on the evolutionary distance. And it will generate something that looks a little bit more like this. And so this, you can see all of these different strains um, and uh, kind of subclassifications um, in domain bacteria on the top. You can see archaea down here and eukaryotes. And so this is really just to, to show the diversity in a little bit more realistic way, um, but still in a universal phylogenetic tree. And so the diversity that we see in these phylogenetic trees and diversity we see in microbes um, and the fact that they exist in all three domains, this evolution has been driven specifically in bacteria and archaea by the same things that drive evolution in eukaryotes, uh, the, the accumulation of mutations, right? And so 
Beneficial mutations can drive uh, the generation of new species in the same way that they do in eukaryotic organisms. Uh, but bacteria and archaea are special in that their evolution can actually be driven in another way by a thing called horizontal gene transfer. And so mutations and uh, kind of genetic information, when we think about that, passing from parent to offspring or from the mother cell to two daughter cells when it splits is considered a form of vertical gene transfer. So parent to offspring is vertical. Horizontal gene transfer would basically be from uh, offspring to offspring or sibling to sibling or from me to you. So me being able to give you a gene would be considered a method of horizontal gene transfer. And obviously we know that does not exist in humans uh, it does, however, exist in bacteria and archaea. And we'll talk more about the different types of horizontal gene transfer later in the course. But this mechanism of being able to share genes between different kind of siblings is a, what allows microbial evolution to happen um, especially quickly. And it can even happen in a matter of two weeks. And so I would encourage you to check out this link here it actually shows a really cool experiment of bacteria evolving antibiotic resistance in a period of about 11 days. And in 11 days, bacteria can go from completely susceptible to antibiotics and all you know, being killed to being able to resist a thousand times the normal dose of antibiotic. Um, and so it's a really cool experiment. I highly encourage you to just check out this link um, and watch that video. It's like a two minute video. Um, and just, uh, I want to reiterate how quickly evolution happens in microbes and also how important it is um, for kind of humans to understand microbial evolution, especially in the context of microbes being able to generate resistance to antibiotics because that's one of the largest health crises, health crises facing uh, humans in 2021.